So the way this will work is um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, give the beginning part of the talk and afterwards uh, uh, Shuba will come and change places with me for the second half of the talk. But it's, uh, there are not really two halves, it's just one continuous talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to uh, talk about the computation of primary production using as input data remotely sensed uh, <coughs> data on the chlorophyll field collected by uh, visible spectral radiometry. It's a big topic and uh, we just want to uh, introduce some of the basic ideas. For those people who would like to follow the de mathematical details, you should have received a file from Marie which is called ppomni.pdf and it contains all the mathematics you would ever want to know about this topic. Okay? Um, so, if you remember, uh, yesterday we spoke about the um, ocean ecosystem as a machine or a thermodynamic system powered by the sun with the pigment molecules in phytoplankton being the collector for the uh, solar input of energy into the ecosystem. So the initial um, use to which this energy is put by the ecosystem is to drive photosynthesis uh, which then provides the um, the biochemical energy that's going to sustain not just the phytoplankton, but the rest of the, the entire ocean ecosystem. Okay. And as we said, the role of uh, chlorophyll is uh, critical in this uh, process. Uh, fortunately, we're able to map the chlorophyll fields on synoptic scales using ocean color. And if uh, this were not the case, then there would be there would be no uh, reason to have this training course. So we are very fortunate that, the, that these um, processes work the way they do and observe them from space. So when the photons are absorbed into the ocean ecosystem they can go uh, uh, they can follow different pathways one of the pathways is to um, make photosynthesis but this is not by any means the only one or even the most uh, important in the sense that uh, only uh, around 1% or so of the photons going in are going into photosynthesis. Uh, most of the rest are just going to uh, be dissipated as heat. Anyway, this is the pathway that we're going to talk about today. When Shuba talks on uh, Friday, I think, uh, she will talk about the heat budget uh, and that will that will be uh, dealing with the pathway so we have to uh, learn a few terms for those people who don't know them beginning with uh, biomass when we
Ben lag... Uh, is, is a derivative of the biomass. In fact, it's the derivative with respect to time. Primary production is the rate of change, or rate of production of phytoplankton through photosynthesis. So for higher organisms, you can think of it as the reproduction and growth. Uh, and uh, you can think of it as being some interest on some money that you might uh, have in the bank. So when I said at the beginning that the primary production was the rate of change of phytoplankton, actually it was a mistake. It's the rate of production of phytoplankton. We also have rates of loss of phytoplankton, and it's only the, um, the change that we observe is the net change of the uh, rate of production, which is what we're talking about, primary production, discounted by the last terms. So uh, primary production is the turnover of the phytoplankton through photosynthesis. And because it's a derivative, it has different units, different dimensions than the biomass. So it's just a derivative with respect to time. So the dimensions contain time in the denominator. Um, most of you will have seen this at some stage. Uh, here is the schematic for uh, photosynthesis in, um, a sim a sim in a simple terms as we can put. We have in the, on the left hand side water and carbon dioxide and then we must have uh, some catalyst, um, in this case uh, radiant energy, to make the equation go in the direction from left to right. So uh, carbon dioxide and water, with the aid of this catalyst, um, radiant energy, will produce on the right side uh, some uh, sugar and will uh, release um, uh, oxygen and will, of course, as all processes, will uh, dissipate energy. So we, what we end up with is some energy um, which is now stored in the ecosystem in chemical form. Initially in the form of phytoplankton tissue, and then uh, eventually um, uh, it will be used uh, to make the tissues of uh, all the rest of the organisms in the ecosystem. So uh, to get this uh, absorption, as we've discussed, uh, chlorophyll is the key. Now, although this... Um, slide doesn't show it, uh, this reaction can also go backwards. So all this organic material on the right side can go uh, be decomposed into these uh, inorganic uh, starting points. That process is called respiration. It's just the, the uh, reverse reaction to the photosynthesis. And sometimes we will want to talk about uh, respiration as well. Is it okay? Now, um, primary production is growth of phytoplankton. What are the requirements uh, for phytoplankton growth? As with any green plant, they need water. Not so much problem in the ocean. Carbon dioxide, also not so much problem in the ocean. Because the ocean is buffered, uh, the car carbonate system in the ocean is buffered such that um, it's uh, generally there is a plentiful supply of carbon dioxide in the surface layer of the ocean 
and uh, it needs extreme, extremely intense phytoplankton growth before you can notice a reduction in the concentration of CO2 in the water in the, uh, in the mixed layer. And, and keep in mind also that the surface ocean is in contact with the atmosphere and CO2 is able to diffuse very freely from the atmosphere into the water. So carbon dioxide generally we don't consider to be a limiting resource. It needs light and light will not be a problem so long as the activity is going on sufficiently close to the surface of the of the ocean where the uh, where the sun's energy comes in. If you go down to 3,000 meters, then, of course, uh, visible light will be a highly limiting, uh, in fact, impossibly limiting resource. But uh, near the surface, uh, this is, um, uh, this should be uh, possible, and you have to remember that the reduction in available light for photosynthesis inside the ocean decreases exponentially with depth. Exponential is a very strong uh, rate of reduction and uh, that's what we have in the ocean. Now uh, the final resource uh, is a suite of uh, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon, and so on. And these indeed uh, can be in very short supply at different times and places. They're not always in short supply, but th they can be, and very often they are. The reason is that in the ocean, the big reservoirs of these chemical compounds is in the deep water. And in the deep water, as we've mentioned, uh, usually it's dark. So photosynthesis is favored when there is some mechanism that will bring the nutrient-rich water from its reservoir, the bottom of the ocean, towards the surface, some vertical exchange. So this is a requirement uh, of um, for for growth of phytoplankton and is uh, can be um, exceedingly limiting, but in certain seasons, for example, in the springtime in temperate latitudes, uh, we we will have um, even an excess of nutrients. So it's a seasonal story as well as a regional story. Okay? Anything's not clear, please uh, stop and stop me and ask. Now why does um, why does primary production change? What factors would be involved regionally and seasonally uh, to make primary production change? So First thing, of course, is the phytoplankton biomass itself. If there's, no, if there's no biomass present to capture photons, then there won't be any primary production. If there's a bigger biomass, then at least uh, the first step can be accomplished, namely to trap the solar energy and um, prepare to make... Uh, photosynthesis. Next uh, thing will be at the time and place uh, of interest. What is the intensity of the sunlight and what is the duration of that sunlight throughout the day? Um, if you come from the tropics you may think this is a silly a silly point, but if you come from a northern uh, high-latitude place, 
Uh, you know that uh, sometimes the duration of the daylight day is zero hours and uh, very few hours. And in the, the intensity also uh, may be uh, very um, weak uh, depending on latitude and season. Next point is, um, as we were just talking about, the concentration of certain uh, nutrients in the water. And though th the, the concentration of those nutrients uh, might be uh, dependent on this uh, turbulence in the water, where the turbulence is stirring the water column. And uh, tending to lift the nutrients more towards the surface. Local temperature or the local water temperature is a factor. Not such as not such a strong not such an important factor I think. <clears throat> but nevertheless you know the um, physiological processes uh, are temperature uh, can be temperature dependent and it can be described by Arrhenius uh, function. So it's, for me it's rather a weak dependence. Now um, another uh, set of factors relate to the kinds of phytoplankton present. Um, as you know uh, phytoplankton is not uh, just one pool of uh, organisms all with the same properties. It's not like if you if you just tried to describe, let's say, an ideal gas. It's it's just a population, enormous population of molecules all have exactly the same properties. It's not like that at all. In this case, it's a highly mixed up, heterogeneous um, group of uh, organisms, single cells from one to 250 microns in diameter. And they belong to different uh, taxonomic groups. So, there's a great deal of richness in the kinds of phytoplankton that participate in, phyto in, in primary production. For those people who are interested in the topic but have never seen phytoplankton, never seen them in uh, live ones, uh, we should be able to arrange for you to look in a microscope while you're here. So anybody who wants to see phytoplankton for the first time, could you let me read more somebody and we'll try to find somebody who'll show them to you in the microscope. It's, um, if you've not done it, it's very worthwhile. Uh, I can promise you. Now, um, different groups, uh, you will find um, contain pigments other than chlorophyll. So that's one of the factors that um, uh, affect their ability to make uh, primary production. And of course there are different sizes. This is another factor because their size controls to a certain extent their efficiency to absorb photons. Okay, you can read all about that in this PPM Omni file if you want to. Uh, so, kinds of phytoplankton are also a major factor. So, so once we've got primary production, what um, what would the what will be the fate of the newly synthesized? organic material. So, um, a number of things may happen. Remember I told you yesterday that uh, phytoplankton tend to be slightly heavy with respect to water, seawater. 
So phytoplankton may sink. That's one of the things they do. Um, they may be uh, removed by advection. That happens. Or they may be concentrated by advection. That's another thing that can happen. The cells may die from disease. And one of the sources of uh, phytoplankton mortality that is uh, believed to be important but is not fully understood is, um, is mortality by virus uh, attack. So uh, the natural mortality is a factor. And then there's another kind of mortality. Um, they may be eaten by uh, other members of the food web, uh, uh, for example, uh, what we generally call the zooplankton, right? P and the, the verb that they use in English for this is grazing, in the same way they use for cows eating grass in a field, they use for, for zooplankton uh, eating phytoplankton, grazing or browsing. Okay, so these are some of the things that can happen to the new cells produced by photosynthesis. Now, uh, so what do the numbers look like? In the surface ocean, we believe there are roughly uh, three uh, gigatons of uh, carbon and globally and annually the fixation or uh, the processing of carbon in photosynthesis by phytoplankton is of order 50 gigatons so it's uh, you can see if you if you divide uh, 3 into 50, you can have a rough, rough first order estimate of the turnover time of the, of the microbiota. Remember, it's a microflora. Turnover of the microflora in the ocean. Now, um, about, about one third of this 50 gigatons, so one third it says roughly 16 gigatons, that is lost from the surface layer by sinking. So you see it's not, not uh, insignificant. About a third is, is being lost by sinking. Uh, and uh, one of the magic words in this story is exported. And so this export, so-called so export production, is referred to in other contexts as the biological pump. Now just to give uh, a scale of comparison, uh, the emission of fossil fuels to the atmosphere by, by man are thought to be around uh, 10 gigatons in a year. Okay. So the scale of the flux of carbon through photosynthesis is uh, same order of magnitude at least as um, as what's going into the atmosphere from anthropogenic uh, sources. Now, the other thing is that the on the land, remember there's an ecosystem on the land, it's also making primary production with all those uh, trees and grasslands and so on. Uh, and it's believed that the net primary production by terrestrial plants is roughly commensurate with that by the 
um, ocean uh, microflora. So primary production in the land and the sea is about the same. The biomass of carbon on the land is massive compared with the biomass of the microflora. And so to have the to have the rates of primary production being the same then requires that the microflora or the phytoplankton do everything very much faster than do the plants on the land. Okay, so we, uh, we deduce that this has to be so. Does anybody know what the reason for that would be? Can anybody make a educated guess about why the why the ocean flora should be growing so much faster than the terrestrial flora sorry speak up eh? don't be shy well they're unicellular and they have very short periods of incubation. okay uh, that's, that's that's a good answer yeah. so the point is that the, these are uh, very small organisms in the ocean. And very generally in biology, we don't have so many generalizations that we can rely on, but very generally in biology, we can say that small organisms do things a lot faster than larger ones. So if, if you're comparing the activity of single cells against the activity of um, tropical rainforest, for example, with the massive uh, trees, then uh, the phytoplankton are going to grow much, much faster every time. So uh, the, it's an interesting problem at the moment, actually one that interests uh, Shubra and me at the moment, is to um, pin down as, as nicely as possible what this uh, typical turnover rate is for the ocean microflora uh, compared with the terrestrial uh, flora. So uh, anyway, I don't want to dwell on it too much. You get the idea, I think, eh? Now, um, in this uh, primary production story, which has been based on carbon so far, um, sometimes uh, it's useful for us to consider the nitrogen part of the uh, story. Because, you know, um, uh, nitrogen is required uh, for the uh, phytoplankton initially to make amino acids, right? So, so it's a very important resource. What, what is necessary to understand is that the phytoplankton can get the nitrogen uh, in, in two different forms. One form is the nitrogen that comes from the deep water reservoirs. Okay, and that, that's this, uh, this flux into the mixed layer here. Remember there is, material is going out by sediment, sedimentation. In a dynamic equilibrium, there has to be some nitrogen coming back, and it's coming back from the deep uh, reservoir. The important point about this nitrogen is that it's oxidized. Okay, it's in the form of nitrate. So um, there is another form of nitrate, uh, of, excuse me, there's another form of nitrogen available in the mixed layer, and that is nitrogen that has been made available through regeneration as a product of metabolism 
of the uh, of the ecosystem. So products of metabolism uh, generally will be uh, nitrogen will be reduced, as that's uh, chemically uh, what's happened to it. So we have um, a source of nitrogen reduced, manufactured inside the mixed layer. And we have a source of nitrogen oxidized, produced outside, and transported into the um, mixed layer. So the one that's coming from the outside is called uh, referred to as new nitrogen. New nitrogen, that's the terminology in the field. Uh, and the other one is called regenerated nitrogen. And it's possible to partition the primary production into the component that depends on new nitrogen, that's called new production, and the component that depends on regenerated nitrogen, which is called regenerated production. And the sum of them it will be the total primary production. And the importance of that is that this uh, new production, it's the, the downward flux that balances this upward flux, um, the new production is considered to be uh, synonymous with the export production, and that's, um, that's a component that we like to know uh, for climate models. Because uh, if, you have, if you have any carbon in this layer, It has easy access to the atmosphere through the ocean surface on a time scale of one day or less. Okay, we, we say that the anything in this layer can see the atmosphere on a time scale of a day or, or less. Whereas any carbon, organic carbon, that gets exported below the mixed layer before it's been respired is now entrained in a layer which because of this density interface this layer might not see the atmosphere for another hundred years. So there is a huge difference in time scale of proximity to the atmosphere for water in this layer, this horizon, compared with water on this horizon. Okay, so that's why the big interest is on the sedimenting or export part, the new production. And it turns out when we talk about the fisheries, which I will hope to do on Thursday, that we'll want to come back to this new production. So, final point is to say that uh, people use this um, something called the F ratio as the ratio of new production to total production. Okay? And remember uh, one uh, yardstick figure I gave was 16 out of uh, 50, so one uh, roughly a third at that point. That would be that would imply an F ratio of 0.3. Okay. No. What's uh, how much time is it? Okay, I'll go a little bit. Uh, this is pretty much the same story. So. Um, you can see here, this is CO2 coming from the atmosphere into there. Um, 
may, maybe get respired back through the atmosphere pretty much uh, immediately, or it, it may get um, entrained into this uh, below the thermocline where the time scale for exchange with the atmosphere is much, much longer. Now, against this background, we can see uh, what the uh, determinants of um, uh, primary production will be. We, in, in our work, we prefer to separate the, the major factors into two groups, a uh, first order group and uh, the rest. So first order are the available light and the uh, pigment concentration. You need the light, we need the pigments to capture the light. So these have to be the first order uh, determinants. Now, uh, secondarily, we will, we will uh, fact, we can factor the nutrients, temperature, uh, some details about the community structure, the growth history, which is um, will um, determine how the cells may have acclimated to uh, conditions of uh, light or dark and so on, and the stratification in the water column. So th these are, if we're going to make a model about uh, primary production, uh, we use this template, we deal with the first order factors first and then worry about the second order factors uh, uh, later. And this is what we want to find, uh, this is what we want to model. We have primary production P, which is a function of available light. And the light as I mentioned earlier, depends on the depth and the dependence is exponential. Okay, so d we have um, Z increasing, depth increasing, then the light is reducing, uh, decreasing uh, exponentially. In addition, the light at the surface depends on the time of the day, okay? So the primary production is a rather complicated function of the light, which depends on depth and on time. And what we get uh, as our, the goal of our model is the integral of the primary production over the course of the day, that's from uh, the d is the day length, over the course of the day and throughout the water column, so this is the integral on z um, of this uh, function. I haven't, and I haven't told you at the moment what this function is, but it's... Um, it's it's a curve that's going to describe the um, response of the pigment biomass to changes in available light, and it will turn out to be uh, a hyperbola. Okay. Now um, we can. Uh, for those of you who've heard of um, a process called dimensional analysis, we can apply it to this integral to, uh, to see what form the integral will have. Okay? What will the answer look like for this PZT on the left-hand side? And when, when we make this dimensional analysis, 
we find the so-called uh, canonical form for the daily water column primary production. It has two parts, uh, uh, a constant multiplied by a function of a dimensionless irradiance. Now, um, in physics, dimensionless numbers are uh, the, the magic numbers. And this uh, dimensionless number uh, comes out of the analysis very naturally. And it's the ratio of the uh, surface irradiance at midday uh, normalized to some property of the uh, photosynthesis light curve, which I'll show you in a minute. Okay, so, and then the constant is here. It's the biomass chlorophyll concentration multiplied by photosynthesis parameter, I'll show you in a minute, multiplied by the day length and divided by the uh, K that was the rate constant for decay of light uh, in, the, in the water column. So this is a, a result that uh, it has to have this form by virtue of the dimensions of the problem. It cannot be anything else. And so the trick is to be able to find this uh, dimensionless function. Um, which we have done, and now I should say that, um, well, let me go a little bit further, then I will say, is it time for me to stop yet, or just keep going a bit? Yeah, when you, when you um, want to construct a model now to actually uh, make a detailed study of that problem uh, as, as opposed to the semi-qualitative thing that I've just talked about. You have to make some decisions. Um, you know, the earliest models were simple regression models, that some statistical regressions that uh, in the end don't teach you very much uh, compared with what you can learn from a deterministic approach. Then you you have to decide whether you use a linear photosynthesis response which only works well at low light or whether you use um, a nonlinear um, model for the photosynthetic response which is more um, more what we know to be the truth whether you will accept um, that the distribution of biomass in the vertical is uniform, which sometimes is true. For example, if you're in the middle of one of those hurricanes now, you can bet that the chlorophyll biomass will be absolutely vertically uniform. Whereas if you go to the same Sargasso Sea in a very calm day, uh, it will not be uh, uniform at all. Then we have the difference between a photosynthesis response where we ignore the spectral dependence uh, or one where we include uh, the spectral dependence, which is a known, a known dependence. So when we suppress it, we're suppressing some information that we we know is actually there, but uh, for some, in some cases it's convenient to make a non-spectral treatment. So these are the principal decisions that one has to make. And important in the story 
is this so-called uh, photosynthesis light curve, photosynthesis irradiance curve, the um, photosynthetic response of the chlorophyll uh, uh, phytoplankton, chlorophyll and the photosynthetic units in which they're embedded, the response of those units to changes in available light. So this is a scale here of available light. And this is the um, response rate of photosynthesis where the superscript B means it's been normalized to the pigment biomass. Remember we said this was one of the one of the two first order factors. Whatever my pigment biomass was a first order factor. So there it is and it's normalizing the primary production. And this is the other first order factor. You can make an experiment at C uh, to measure this curve. See, these uh, would be experimental uh, data points. And then you can fit to, this, uh, to these data a model that will contain two parameters. One of them is this asymptote, which is called assimilation number, PMB. And the other is the slope of this line uh, at the origin, which is called alpha. So these two parameters, PMB and alpha B, tell you all that you want to know about the photosynthesis response. We can derive another parameter from them, which is this one, IK, called the photoadaptation parameter. And this is the one that's used to normalize against the surface irradiance to get that dimensionless irradiance uh, I star M. Okay, so this is the basic experiment. I think some of you have done this experiment at sea. And anybody done these experiments? Yeah, a few of you, yeah? So uh, it's a lot of work, as I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll all agree. In, in my time, my group has done thousands of them, but it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Now, there is a spectral response, as I said. Um, this pink one is the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. And the yellow one is the spectral dependence of the photosynthesis response. So that spectral dependence of the photosynthesis response is called the action spectrum. That's a, a, an old name in the literature, but that's the name it's, we have to use because you can't change it now. Action spectrum. So it means the, and you can see it's very, very similar to the absorption spectrum. And the principal difference you see is in here. And for those who are familiar with the term, the reason is the possible presence of the so-called photoprotective pigments. Okay, I, I won't say any more than that uh, just at the moment. Okay. So the, there is a spectral dependence. We are may not choose to, um, to write explicitly in, in the equation. Now, um, it's very easy, it turns out to be very easy to change uh, a non-spectral model into a spectral one. And it's because um, the 
models, when we have this quantity alpha, when it appears in a primary production model, it will always be multiplying on I. They're, they're, they're inseparable. You cannot, uh, you cannot divorce the alpha from the I. Right? So they're always joined. And so we call that product capital Pi. I times alpha. And all you have to do to make a non-spectral model spectral is to write this pi to include the wavelength components. So now, uh, whereas it was a, a I times alpha, it's now an I lambda times alpha lambda integrated over lambda. And you simply replace the capital pi in the non-spectral model with the spectral uh, version. Uh, and then you can get this extended formalism for uh, here's an example. This is a non-spectral model for the um, photosynthesis light curve. This is the so-called Smith equation, and uh, th those who are familiar with looking at the equations will see that this is in the form of a rectangular hyperbola. So uh, there is the product of I times alpha, and here is the product of I times alpha, and we just substitute those now with the spectral, uh, include the lambda dependence. So um, I know that's difficult for some people, but I'm not going to spend any more time on it. You can look it up in, the, in that file, PPM Omni. Um, just, uh, I think this is the place I want to stop, I think, whenever Shuba comes back. And I want to say that any of you who are interested to discuss these equations, the person in the room who has made the most progress integrating them, Jocko, he just uh, made his PhD about it. So he would be the, the group's expert on these equations also. So um, uh, he has a nice poster about it over there. Also.